Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of The Thunder Heist, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, starting with Mike. Oh, correct. Me first. Okay, hi. Yeah, I don't feel like doing anything. Else. <laughs> it's too Rob. hot in here. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Rob Hayes, uh, author of, I'm going to pick a book. Hang on, here we go. Here's one that nobody's ever read. Drones. Drones. <laughs> a sci-fi book about emotions Tempest being stuff, harvested, no I believe. It is, but nobody knows that because it's never been read by anybody, so it's fine. <laughs> Fletcher, <laughs> wrote, Fletcher wrote it anyway. So, And yeah. lastly, Dirk. Uh, I am Dirk, author of the Paternus Trilogy. And we are joined and once again else. by the wonderful John Gwynn. John, welcome back to the show. Hey guys, great to be here again. <laughs> and this time, uh, I believe you, you have uh, the Shadow of the Gods for you to hold up and uh yes, oh, yes. Oh, beautiful really cover. Is, yeah. yeah this so this is the latest my latest book shadow of the gods book one of the blood swan saga with a very lovely cover that's amazing so cool. that's a big dragon big yeah. dragon uh, <laughs> so very for our... person down here <laughs> yeah tiny little person um no, so audio listeners... tell tell us since we're going to talk about this stuff anyway who are those characters because those are actually characters, even the dragon, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but what I did well, when we were having a chat about cover, uh, myself, my editor, and my agent, I, um, you know, I, I, I put forward the idea of a, of a big dragon, which went down re really well <laughs> with uh, with the team. So That's a um, big dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew so dragons I on fantasy covers go down well? Oh. Also, just yeah, quickly for our audio listeners, just to just can you just describe what the cover looks like, just for people who may be listening without a video feed? A okay, giant so, dragon and a little person. Yeah, it's a very big <laughs> dragon looking at a very tiny person. That's, that's basically it. Well, well, well the um, person isn't tiny. The person's normal size. It's the dragon. <laughs> just a tiny. really big <laughs> dragon. That's a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, so with the cover, I just um, I cut and pasted a scene from uh, towards the end of the book. And um, that got sent through to the to the cover artist. And this is what they came up with. That's me. There's, there's a little bit of artistic license in there. Um, but so some of the details have been taken out just to make the just to make the visual clearer, I think, and a bit sharper. Mm -hmm. But it's basically something that does happen towards the end of the book. Cool. Uh, yeah, I don't want to tell you who they are because that would be that would be spoilers. Ah, okay. okay. Who's the cover artist? Marcus Winnie. It's it's his first cover art. Oh wow! wow. That's yeah, his I mean, first cover art. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. Jeez. laughs> okay. I mean, okay. Yeah, you know, he's he's a great guy, and he's he, he's on Instagram. Um, and I think he worked on things like Justice League. You know, uh, hmm. in the art department, art crew there. But um, yeah, so that's his first his first cover. And good news is, I've just heard he's signed up for the for book two as well. So he'll be doing the second cover. Oh, awesome! Yeah, that's nice. beautiful. So I, I really Marcus M A R C U S. How do you spell his last name? W H I N E Y. Marcus Winnie. Marcus Winnie. Marcus. So are, you, are, you, Winnie. are you writing book two at the moment? I finished book two. Um, okay. Um, Ooh. Yeah. I, I was just like, you, yep. you seem quite prolific, to be honest, because like, I only just finished uh, Faithful in the Fallen like last year. And then uh, and then you were releasing, I think, like the second book in, in your your second series. And I was like, yeah. oh, wow. So I bought all of those. I haven't read them yet. Uh, and then suddenly you're releasing a new book in a new series. And I'm just like, stop writing so fast. <laughs> well, I think, I, I mean, I, maybe fast compared to some, but it's um, pretty much kind of the this standard industry regulation, I think one is roughly a book a year. Yeah. Since I started, it took me about six or seven years to write Malice, the first book, but since then it's been roughly a book a year. They're big do books you, too. Do you keep yeah. posters? Are you a word counter? Do you try to hit a word count? A I day? Am. So how yeah. many days a week do you write? Well, I'm very lazy. So um, I, <laughs> Like I finished book two last about a month ago, and I haven't written anything uh, <laughs> over the last. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, take, it's been a busy month. <laughs> I take big long breaks between. Yeah, which but when which, I sit down to write, I try to do two. Uh, you know, I, my, I aim for two thousand words a day, mm -hmm. something like that. If I hit 
you know, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 words a week, then I'm really happy. Those yeah. are kind of targets I set myself. I don't always make them. Yeah. But uh, that's what I aim for. Yeah. It sounds it sounds almost reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell myself. <laughs> so I thought yeah, today we could um, get closer and closer and <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that can be its own type of motivating um I thought that for today we could kind of uh continue on with something that we sort of were foreshadowing a bit at the end of our last talk which is the idea of sort of incorporating you know viking history and myth and inspiration into you, your own work so for you John what is it about kind of the the viking mythos I guess that fascinates you well, I think, um, I mean, it's it's going back to being a kid for me. I think all of my writing, when, when I started writing, I my, my only mantra was write what you want to read. Yep. You know, that's, so that's always really important to me. And so, um, so what I wanted to read is stuff that I've grown up loving um, with a contemporary twist, you know. So right back, from my, the first book I fell in love, I can remember, uh, is was the Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander. Um, it got made into a Disney movie af after a while. The the, um, the Black Cauldron. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, you, if that yeah. the bell with you guys, but I was only seven. I, or eight I saw old. I saw that when it was released. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me too. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I I was read that by my by my teacher when I was seven or eight years old. You know, they the teacher sat us all down on the carpet in a circle and, and he pulled out this book and started reading. And I just yeah. remember being whisked away to this mythological, fantastical world with oracular pigs, you know, and, and brave warriors and, and dead, dead soldiers. And um, I begged my mum to buy me book one and two. And she, I think she took me out that weekend and got them. And that was the, that was the beginning of, of me, being hooked on fantasy you know uh, it's a slippery slope after that isn't it of hobbits <laughs> and race and dragons and oh yeah but I, I remember as i was growing up i used to, you know i always used to read a lot um and it was it was fantasy was kind of the foundation stone but i used to as part of it i'd read a lot of mythology you know all those old tales of troy and king arthur and a lot of norse myth norse stuff as well like, you know ragnarok and beowulf and berserkers mm -hmm. and all that stuff just it, it when I think of it it just feels like it's part of growing up for me it's part of that nostalgic feeling that or sense I get when I think about you know what I used to read as, as a child it's exactly so really, exactly what it is like for me too yeah cool yeah yeah and I think it's and I think that's you want to you want to be passionate about what you write about don't you so so that's you know that's where my my love for fantasy but also for mythology and so I, I think you know I, I, I to mythology and then I found myself starting to read historical novels and, and you know just being interested in history you know I'm a closet historian <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I love history so uh, and that's the other genre that I read or, or I've, I've always read a lot of is, is historical novels, you know. Bernard Cornwell stuff. And Bernard thing. Cornwell is yeah. just, I mean, he, I, I love Bernard Cornwell's writing. His series on Arthur is one of my most favourite series ever. You know, that, that trilogy, I, I read it fairly regularly and weep every time. Um, so so uh, going back to why I've, I've written a, a series that's strong on kind of uh, Norse mythology and Viking era history that's basically why it's because I love it um, and I've loved it since I was a kid and and that's you know that's why I'm a reenactor now which really it's just big kids with <laughs> playing with swords you know, <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's just you get to scream fun. shield wall and stab people it's fun absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's not to like about that you know it's great fun <laughs> Could you the injuries, the injuries aren't to like about it. Oh yeah, that's a fair point. That is a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a bit more about your Viking reenactment stuff? That's really fascinating to me. I would love to give that a yeah. like, give that a crack someday. I know Rob's done a bit of it as well, so maybe you guys could both kind of talk about yeah, what that's sure. taught you for writing and maybe some misconceptions it's it's fixed up or you know new Spears insights. Hurts. Into... That's what it taught me. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, I was writing before I was a reenactor. I've been reenacting for about 
five, six years now, something like that. And there's a group fairly close to me because um, there's a there's kind of Vikings UK is is that is the kind of umbrella group uh, in the UK, but they're they're split up into smaller subgroups. And there's a group close to me called the Spears of Android, and I started training with them. Yeah, five, six years ago, something like that. And because um, I've just seen them at, I, I've always gone to kind of medieval um, uh, festivals, you know, and yeah. just enjoyed being being there and spectating. And I always thought I'd love to have a go at this. And then when I found out that this group was fairly close, um, you know, it's just the perfect opportunity. So along we went with, with my three sons. And um, the first session, we just got handed a spear given a rusty old helmet and uh, a shield and got taught the very basics, you know, of shield <laughs> and spear work. And it was, I mean, it was, uh, as we were doing it, it was, we were just smiling, you know, cause it just felt so cool. <laughs> but it was even from that first moment after about 10 or 15 minutes, I had a burn in my shoulder it's, and it, you know, I mean, I thought I was re- fairly fit and, and strong, but after, 15 20 minutes i had to i just had to step out of the combat and drop my to, to let my shoulder recover you know because you're using muscles in a different way i i, I guess mm-hmm. but um so right from the beginning it's little details like that that i wouldn't really you know we all write from our imagination but they're details that i wouldn't probably wouldn't have thought of mm-hmm. um you know like like mail to wear a coat of mail it's heavy you know, it's heavy and you yeah. feel the weight on your shoulders because it just hangs on them. Mm-hmm. So then you use your, your weapons belt to kind of just take that weight off the shoulders a little bit, you know, and so it's details like that okay. that I never would have thought of before that hopefully now add the, add just layers to to um, what I'm writing, you know, some, some, and some authenticity, hopefully, you know. Yeah. I mean, one um, of the favourite things I always took from it was um, uh, it was... I think about six months in where I, I'd been sort of with sort of spear and, and sex and everything. And then somebody handed me an ax and went, give that one a go. And it's like a bearded ax. I absolutely loved it because suddenly I could just hook people's shields and pull them away and let somebody <laughs> else do the stab. And I was like, right, this is my weapon. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely love that. That little detail of like in a shield wall where it's just like, yeah, you just hook the, uh, hook the shield with your bearded ax and just yeah. pull it away from them. Yeah. Um, without, without going into details, uh, one thing I did learn is never ever slip on a double male shirt without something underneath it. <laughs> oh. If you have body hair. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Always wear a gambeson. Don't. <laughs> Don't. Even Rose. if you're like, oh, just for a second. No. No. <laughs> but anyway, I've got, we'll we got a funny story like that. The first time I, I put on a coat of mail, I was at, um, at the Battle of Hastings, the reenactment for the Battle of Hastings. Nice. Um, and there's like a traders fair there, you know. So I thought, right, I've been doing this a little while. I need to get a coat of mail. And there's a guy there selling a, a you know a really nice coat of mail. So I tried it on, and I got stuck, which is utterly humiliating. But it, I literally got it over my head, my shoulders, and my oh, because it's it's not easy. You don't don't have zips or buckles. You know, yeah. it's, there's quite an arc to getting into it. You kind of slither into it and let it <laughs> fall down. I've seen so this picture on your slipping. website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it got stuck around, so wrapped around my head. My arm stuck in like under this position, <laughs> and, and I, honestly, I couldn't get it on. I couldn't get it off. I couldn't move, and, and then <laughs> I started to panic a little bit. And then this noise kind of started filtering through the mail, Uh-oh. and I realised it was laughter. <laughs> <laughs> It was first of all my family who were all with me and have found it utterly hilarious. But then, you know, a crowd was around us just found us. So that's one of my most humiliating moments. But I want to try and write a character now who gets stuck in his coat of mail. First yeah. Time yes. yeah. 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 You just don't see that, do you? You don't see that moment when, uh, yeah, before yeah. the before the big battle where Aragon is like, yeah, trying to get his mail armor on and he's stuck in there and all the other people yeah. are trying to yank him out of it. Yeah. Well, there's a, I think there's a reason why in that, you know, in that scene where he's getting dressed uh, for mm. um, heading out for the Black Gate, he's yeah. got people dressing him. There's, yes. there's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not just him being lazy and not picking out his own no. outfit. It's like you have to have people help you with this. Otherwise, yeah, you're not going to yeah. make what it out. Squires are for. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other details about, um, you know, combat or, or armor that you've 
picked up from the Viking reenactment stuff? Oh, I mean, so many. I mean, um, the one that Rob mentioned is a great one, you know, about about the bearded axe and using that to hook a shield. Hmm. Um, but even before you get to combat, um, you know, one of the things that I learned was, uh, because you, you wear gloves, uh, and um, but you, you don't want to put your gloves on first, because then you can't buckle your helmet up, or you can't buckle yeah. your, your belt, because... You, you know, you, your fingers are too clumsy. So you always put on, put gloves on last. It's kind of the, the mm -hmm. little rule we laugh at now because we, when we started, we'd always put our gloves on and then realise we have to take them off again. <laughs> <laughs> so details like that. But, but in combat, um, you know, that one about the, the bearded axe is great. The other thing that I noticed very quickly is that when you die, it's not usually from the person that's directly opposite you mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm usually from the people either side yes. because um, you know that the person in front is is trying to give an opening but it's the people opposite uh, the, the the diagonals where they see that opening and then they're they, you know they're darting across with their shield with their spear or their sword or axe or sax or whatever so it's it's just about not being focused on just fighting the person in front of you. You have to be aware of you know the whole. It's wall. hard work though. Like it is, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're in a shield wall and you're you're literally you're you know pr pressed up against another shield wall and that's all you can see basically. And you 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 forget to think, okay, yeah, there are people there. You just you see the person in front of you snarling at you, and you're you're focused on, okay, can I defend against them? Can I? you know stab them and, and and take them out as well and then suddenly yeah you're just like oh hang on i'm dead <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> <No>. oops <laughs> how sharp yeah. are these you weapons can... sorry not sharp how are the weapons like blunted and stuff oh yeah yeah, yeah okay cool we, we're not actually trying to kill each other when we do this jed they frown yeah, on <laughs> actually murdering people <laughs> yeah oh, i remember rob saying that you got stabbed a couple of times with spears and stuff so i'm like i just oh yeah yeah like that, that's why i stopped doing it i i, I took some pretty horrible injuries I, I like i think i broke like two of my ribs with a spear Jeez. at one point i was just yeah. like yeah i'm done <laughs> <laughs> my days of violence are over <laughs> oh, yeah. i retire to my farm and not pick up my spear until i'm in my 60s and some plucky young hero comes here and needs me to train them just absolutely you know. that's just it I'm, I'm done with my fight and i'll be the old mentor character yeah i feel grumpy enough sometimes <laughs> you got a beard for it as well also, John, think, your beard is amazing. I don't think I've seen my, that. My beard is that. nothing compared to John's. Yeah. How long is that? We can't even see John's, is a, it. John's is a beard. Yours is some hair. <laughs> That's not true. Aww. That is a fine beard. Rob. <laughs> it's a there fine you. beard. It's a fine beard. From the master himself. <laughs> stamp of approval it's, on the beard. It's a fine. <laughs> it is a fine beard. It's just the difference between you know. I like, can't braid it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> a seasoned warrior's beard and a peasant beard. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I've graduated slightly from neck beard, but I, it, it's certainly not like yeah, full on braidable or anything like. <laughs> now, I was I was just going to say that that um, I I really you really feel that in your books, John. When when I read this, and it's not the amount of information you put in, it's what you put in the small little. Mm things that that you put in like during the battles and preparing for the battles um you don't have to put in a lot but what you put in feels real and it, it helps it helps pull in and, and um it may you know uh, like uh christian cameron is the one that i think about when i think of more medieval right like uh uh european and yours is more when i think about like because if anybody's not seen Cameron's uh, little video clips that he puts of, of sword I stuff, now, them, yeah. they're just amazing. And Christian's just a really cool guy. Have you ever yeah. met, actually met Christian, John? No, no, I've spoken to him a few times on, online. I feel like I know the guy. because Oh, yeah. Uh, and he's yeah. such a nice guy. So yeah, we got, yeah, we got to, so we got to spend uh, like all, all of uh, Worldcon in Dublin. Right. With, with Christian, hanging out with Christian. That was, we, we got an idea. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I think we still owe him something like showing because of that. We have to, but sure. um, like uh, Daniel Kelly does. I don't know if you've, he's a self pub author, wrote the, um, the fall of the Phoenix uh, does these, these uh, like Trojan Greek battles um, that are in these like 
like a press and pushing up a hill and there i don't know if he's a reenactor re or not but you get the feeling that he is when you read his stuff i mean i just love that stuff that has these little things like the sand and uh, you know uh, the the tip of the, uh, the sandals catching in the sand going up and sometimes that's all it takes and you go down it's just like these weird little things that are put in yeah. and you have a lot of that as well i love that stuff oh thanks dick cheers mate i'm glad it, I'm, I'm glad you feel like the way way you know yeah. just yeah, I, th I think the details uh, really help to ground especially fan fantasy you know so it's nice to know that that i'm yeah. trying to do is, is coming across to you that's, that's great mm -hmm. and that's part of the trick right is balancing between you know yeah. total fantasy and and reality just grounding it every once in a while you know in these in these little kind of facts yeah that, yeah that make it that make it wonderful yeah and, and i mean that's the way i've always approached writing you know because <clears throat> um as i was saying you know i came to writing as by, by a roundabout way really as a hobby and when i actually started i, I when i sat down the first time i sat down to start <laughs> writing I suddenly thought, actually, I don't, I don't really know how to write creatively. The only way I knew how to write was how I'd learned at uni, you know, for all those essays and dissertations and nasty things. But I remember my <laughs> um, my tutor just pounding into us that to, to pass your degree, you need to read, and then you need to read, and then you need to read some more. Yep. Yep. And he was just talking about research, you know, for your essays. And that's and so that's how that was my starting point for writing fantasy you know is it's just that's that's the only way i knew how to write and that's so that's what i did i, I buried myself in the research um but instead of researching you know um dry topics at uni i was researching how to make swords and wolf pack behavior and, and you know all the all the celtic and roman and norse mythology and then the history of Boudicca's revolt and caesar's gallic war and you know all that stuff which which i felt passionate about so mm, yeah. you know and i think that it all just gets thrown into the pot so hopefully you'll there'll be a sense of history in there as well as a sense of um, mythology and a sense of the fantastical that that's you know i mean everyone has their own way of doing it that's how i do it now returning to the characterization <clears throat> part um uh what do you use from your research that uh that helps you decide not just who the characters are or what role they play but how they how you build that character out how do how do you incorporate this sort of research uh and but what you learn in, from mythology into the actual characters themselves okay so well you want you want your characters to feel authentic to whatever you're writing so for to so thinking about but you know my latest series um which is the the norse inspired one i've i've tried to to start off with characters that would feel authentic in that historical period you know so you've got one who is who's a slave who's a thrall or an ex-slave he's on he's a slave on the run actually he's being hunted mm -hmm. you've you've got um a jarl's daughter mm -hmm. who's in one to to build her own battle fame because battle fame back then i think the way i've i read it is that it seems like that was kind of what celebrity status is now you know it is that everyone craves back then they craved battle fame so that their name would live on in a tale long after they're dead and it wasn't just the norse you know um mm -hmm. achilles and you know the greek heroes you often hear them talking about their name living on in, in their in the tales so you've got one woman who's young and she's seeking her battle fame and then you've got another character who's kind of a retired person of violence who is um who is settled down with her husband and son they're, and they're hunters trappers you know they, they just live live a solitary life in the woods and they they um trade with the local village so kind of hopefully your characters are feeling or, or that they would fit into if you were writing a historical novel that they'd fit into that as well that that's kind of so that's a starting point i mean again thinking of um kind of world building and characters I, I think the dialogue you use is also quite important you know something that i'm i'm 
I've thought about a lot in this new series. So the dialogue I use for my characters, I hope you would you would feel like it could fit in Beowulf or, you know, um, maybe not quite as archaic, but but that it feels at home, you know. So I'll, I'll use things like like flightings, you know, which are those kind of Norse word wars. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, so yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And if you've, if you've played um, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you'll know all about flightings. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, the way you use dialogue for characters as well can can do a job as well as being entertaining. And obviously the, 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 the most important thing for me is that it's entertaining. That's why I write to entertain mm -hmm. and hopefully, you know, sweep people away on a tale where they become um, invested in the characters and what's going on. But it, it's all, all part of the mix, isn't it? The, the, that sense of authenticity, I think, helps to draw you in. Well, yeah, the, uh, and that's the, what I like to read. You know. Yes. Just, just a, a quick side. Is, is, is your new one a completely new world? Because I know like your, your second series is part of, it's in the same world as The Faithful and the Fallen, isn't it? That's right, yeah. So, this, so that's, that's exactly right, Rob. Yeah, the first two series are both set in the same world, which is The Banished Lands. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of in, I approached that world with um, the thought that it's basically an alternative mythical slash historical version of Dark Ages Europe. So mm -hmm. if, if you look at the map and then you put a, a map of Europe over the top, you'll see that there's kind of a Celtic area, a, a Latin, Roman, Greek area, a Germanic area, and so on. But with this new series, it's in a completely new world, which is is um, is Norse inspired. So the the it starts off a, a bit more smaller and more intimate than my first um, two series, with less points of view. So that, and the and it takes place in just one country, which is called Vigrith, um, which is the Norse word for the battle plain where Ragnarok was fought. Mm -hmm. So that's the country which has been smashed and destroyed in this kind of cataclysmic Ragnarok type battle of the gods 300 years ago. And now moving forward, you've got this world where kind of humanity is rising out of the ashes and rebuilding the world. And um, they hate and despise the, god, the dead gods because they nearly destroyed the world. But there is a uh, kind of bloodlines of the, the gods left still that have still survived. So, um, for example, I've got a, a bear god called Bursa, and his chip, and, and anyone that's descended from him is a ber berserker. Mm -hmm. um, and they have those kind of blood traits where, so, so um, you know, there's a wolf god and an eagle god, a, a rat and a dragon and a serpent. And so, and all those kind of familiar Norse creatures. And their children are called the tainted and they're hunted by um, humanity now and enslaved and used for um, their abilities. So um, descendants of the hound god, for example, are, are excellent trackers. Um, uh, the berserkers are, are used as bodyguards, you know, um, or like elite, they're elite warriors. Um, so that's that's the kind of the, the idea of the world that I'm trying to build that feels like it's inspired by all that cool Norse stuff, but um, is its own thing, you know. It sounds so, really so, cool. I love the idea of like, you know, the, yeah. the world is scarred by this yeah. massive battle of the gods. So there's, you know, the, the, the scope for these, you know, like massive fantasy wonders that, that are completely unexplainable in like, you know, real life is just, uh, I love that sort of stuff. It, it just really sort of like yeah. gives the world a really sort of epic, amazing feel. Thanks, yeah. Rob. Cheers. I mean, one of the first things that came to me for this series was, you know, obviously Jormungandr is is a is a big part of Norse mythology, and um, so when I was thinking about the gods being dead, well, I thought, well, if this giant snake is dead, where it, what's happened to his body? So, mm -hmm. his basically he his skeleton now forms like this um this mountain range that runs through the center of, of cool. this world. And yeah. his skull, his skull is kind of opening out into the sea in a fjord, and there's a city built within it. Um, so the god's called Snaka, Dread Snaka, and the city's called Snakavik. Um, uh, so that's that, that's the, cool. 
<laughs> thank you. I mean, that, that's the uh, that's the kind of ideas that I tried to put into this, where it feels fantastical, but it also feels like it's a logical continuation mm. from something like Ragnarok, mm. you know. And I was I was going to ask, do you, uh, I was ask if uh, like there's, did, so you use that this was Ragnarok out of Norse mythology or is it, was it Ragnarok like, and is it Normangander or Normangander like, um, it sounds like you're actually referencing as this was the thing. So Thor, Thor called Thor did exist right in your world. Is okay. So, so no, no, the idea is that it takes those ideas. So it's taken Ragnarok as kind of a springboard, um, and uh, okay, I've, and I've so, got a certain god called Snarka, but um, I've quite, but he's not like Jormungandr in that he's probably more like um, Ymir, who is the father of the gods. So uh, if if you're okay. familiar with Norse mythology, yeah, yeah the god Odin, sure. Odin and his brother killed. Yeah, it's so it's it's kind of it, it's really a combination of of using a few things that make you that will definitely make you feel like this is Norse mythology. <laughs> But then okay. trying to to kind of springboard from that into something ah, that's, okay. uh, that's my own take on it. So Thor's not in it, Odin's not in it, you know. But yeah. so you've got um, you've got, they, but they they exist, but they were under different names. They just were kind of the same characters. Some no, some maybe one or two. Like there's there is a god that's kind of similar to Loki. Okay, but okay. but most of them I've tried to just give a different yeah. backstory. To, that's awesome. Know? Yeah. No, that's that's what I was going to ask because, and that that gives you a certain amount of of freedom, right? Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. and I because I remember when I was because I bring in a group of of Norse gods, but in my book, I I actually you know these things actually happened, right? And these characters were actually real. So I ran into like I mean it took me forever to figure out okay. I have to look at all these stories and all these myths and all these interpretations of them and find out who can I say did survive, right? Because then I actually use those names and that was much harder <laughs> than I wish I wouldn't have had to. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, uh, so I, I have, you know, these, these characters the, and these names, including some Valkyries, uh, that that are pulled right out that it it's never said it either says that they survived or it never says they didn't so right. i could pretend hmm. that they survived yeah yeah cool yeah i actually I, I it was it's i mean that it's it was a hard thing to write because i kept getting as i was writing the book I kept getting sucked back into that you know kind of the the events of norse mythology but yeah so very intentionally didn't flesh out my backstory for the gods. I just knew that yeah. I, there was a few that I wanted and I wait, waited until I'd written the first book so that I had the story down. And then I went back and I came up with the backstory based around what, what, what helped and supported the book I'd written because I didn't want to feel restrained or constricted by this imaginary history that I've made up mm. that then stops me from doing things, you know, so I, right. I wrote the story first, just a very kind of broad brushstroke idea of of the kind of my my made up history for the world, and then I went back afterwards and and worked out all the details, you know, so that it made the story more fun and supported what I'd written rather rather than feeling like it was constraining what I write. So I, I didn't want to get to a point where I was two thirds of the way through and then think, oh, I can't do that because in my made up history this happened. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, right. that's hard because yeah, that's it's, hard it's... too, especially when you never get to release other than Joe Abercrombie, you don't get to write in this one last series. Do you ever get to write all the books and then start to release them? Right? So, we yeah, release yeah. one, we release one book, and then we're like, in book three, we're like, oh, fuck, I can't do that. Exactly. I, yeah. this, I can't suddenly give this character this power, or I yeah. can't. No, that, that's exactly that why I write all my books it. before releasing a trilogy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so Rob that's, has a good break for it as well. That's smart. That's that one, a good idea. One thing, that's one thing that a lot of self pubs do have 
yeah. can do if you could write fast enough. See, for me, it'd be like four years before I, read, <laughs> before I did that, before I released the next trilogy. And it, I would have forgotten I even exist. But yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you're doing one book at a time and don't really get the flesh out as you go. That's fascinating stuff. I, I can't wait to get that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it as well. It was funny, actually, because I submitted it to my agent and um, and then she passed it on to my editor at uh, Orbit UK, James Long. And he was like, you know, he, he was very kind and loved the book. And he was like, so what about this? And what about that? And what about, I want to know about this. And I, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't know, know yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's don't always know. a good sign, though, when like your, your, your editor comes back and goes, but, but I want to know more. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. that's a good sign. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I think yeah. we've got to start wrapping this episode up soonish. But uh, before we do, does anyone have any quick last questions, John? Not um, sure if you've been I trolling the internet for questions. Uh, uh, no, see, all the questions I'm seeing are uh, regarding beard care. <laughs> 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 uh, if you want to go there, we can. Uh, John, I have words, another... words, words and beards. What, what, what question? <laughs> um, what is your like favorite underrated Viking myth? Because I think a lot of people are, well, like maybe not a lot of people, but there's in pop culture, like a lot of general knowledge about like Ragnarok or, or, you know, Thor or Loki or whatever. And like the Marvel movies have, have helped with that. But like, what is an obscure Viking yeah. myth <laughs> that you are, they're very different, but like people are aware of the names at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. What is like an obscure Viking myth that not many people have heard of that you really find compelling? Okay. I mean, I've, the, there's, there's lots, but one that springs to mind straight away is, uh, and I, I don't think this is particularly familiar, but um, I might be wrong, but it's it's Loki's quarrel. Um, and it's where Loki is being kicked out of a feast with all the gods. And there's a giant that's been making the feast and his two servants. And Loki turned up and he didn't like the fact that they were all happy. So he killed one of the servants of the giant just to kind of um, vent his, his, his dislike of this. And he got chased away from the feast and banned, but he comes <laughs> back. And he, that, that's kind of the backstory to the to the to the actual um, story. And then he so he, what, the story begins with him coming back and just swaggering into the hall and demanding a seat. And it's very cleverly written. Uh, it's uh, it's another book that's in um, in the Poetic Edda. And he and. Each god in the in the feast, so it starts with Odin, um, you know, tells him that he shouldn't be there because he's a despicable person. And Loki basically gives back as good as he gets and more. So it's it's really a war of words. And he so he puts Odin in his place, and then someone defends Odin, and so he turns on to that person, and then another god or goddess tries to defend that one and he goes through every single god or goddess in the room <laughs> and right. just gives them a, a verbal battering it, it's it's really funny until thor turns up because he's away and he doesn't entertain a verbal battering no he doesn't even try to get into it he he just says if you don't shut up i'm going to smack you on the head with mjolnir uh -huh. and, and uh and loki ends up saying, okay and i'll shut up <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one thing one one thing I, I i still when i return to the the norse myths uh you know the eddas the earlier versions not like later expanded on uh interpretations um uh but uh you know i i always i ex, i i still for some reason expect these stories to be written like some of the arthurian tales or the iliad and the odyssey right um but there are it's like wow that sounds like this like big like a whole book in itself right but so many of these stories take place in over like two pages <laughs> yeah. it's like the whole story they're like yeah. really tiny yeah you know yeah. and you know my a lot of my favorite ones are the uh the ones that really stick in my mind are like the small ones about how the wall was built yeah. you know yeah. with with in his horse and a horse 
and you know uh freya getting jewelry from the dwarves and <laughs> sleeping with them and so there's all this kind of weird stuff but yeah. all these like really fun things even even the even the all the stuff about ragnarok itself is like this long you know yeah. it's like it's not none of this stuff is very long at all no. but every every one you can unpack it just and unpack it and unpack it and unpack it and there's so much that yeah. you can see going on in the background and um i got that kind of feeling from your book when i was reading this because you think you're dealing with human That's malice by the way right you think the, the first book of the faithful and the fallen you think you're dealing i i would think i'm dealing with humans all the way through and i find out that some of these characters might not be humans and you don't really learn a whole <laughs> lot about that in malice but i know that it expands enormously it basically unpacks right um yeah. which i think is really cool thank you thank you yeah that's i mean that was the idea <laughs> Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, um, this has been like a really good two episodes. So John, thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah. If people out there, I'm definitely going to get the shadow yeah. of uh, the gods. That looks amazing. The color looks great. And like the description of it is really awesome. I'd read it just for that city. That's in this giant. Hold, hold dead that up again, skull. John. Um, that is such a cool setting location. And I'm a bit jealous that you thought of it first. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, thank you so much for, for joining us. This is actually us. why we do these things. Jed just likes to uh, come up with it, well, steal ideas from people, yeah. you know, be like, that's oh, it. yes, I like that one. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's pretty do. much it. And then, yeah, I edit the audio so it looks like the idea is coming out of my mouth instead of John's mouth. And yeah, we're, we're brilliant. Free. No one will ever uh, <laughs> prosecute me for that. Um, no, no, thank you so much for coming on, John. This has been really excellent. Oh, it's yeah. been my pleasure. Really no great time to thank you guys. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for uh, thinking of me. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. Thank you so much, John. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, check out our Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash Wizards Warriors Words. Uh, and you can support the show um, and get access to yeah, extra bonus stuff like free advanced reader copies of our books. Um, special shout out as well to our high tier Patreon, Daniel Henderson. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for supporting the Patreon. I think we have like about 10 patrons last time I checked, which is kind of insane. Considering Are we, we just... rich now? Can I, I think so. Can yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you should have a gold gated no, toilet no, arriving no. tomorrow. I don't have to write another book or anything, right? No, no, no. Not oh, at no. All. <laughs> um, you mean I don't have to write any more of Mike's books? <laughs> that's right, Dirk. You can finally stop writing all four of our books. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon. If you want to check that out, yeah, link in the show notes. Uh, and yeah, thanks to John for joining us. See you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Okay, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.